Hi, this is Andrew Francis, and we're going to look at the third part of my series on the image of God and the issue of covering. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, we read this. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if this story had taken a different turn. And before I look a bit further at that question, I just want to make a point. I'm not convinced that sin separates us from God in the way that it's popularly known to. And let me explain. When Adam and Eve sinned, God did not hide from them. Now I understand that God does not abide sin. He can't stand it. It causes all sorts of problems. But it's not in the sense that God is so horrified by our, by our sin that he can't have anything to do with us. In this story here, God still comes looking for them and desires to have relationship with them, with Adam and Eve we're talking about. Sin did not cause God to turn away. But what sin did in Adam and Eve was to cause them to turn away, to hide, to look inwards. They lost sight of God and his love for them. They lost sight of his faithfulness and his goodness. Now, as they look at the evil within their own hearts, as they look at their own potential to sin and do the wrong thing, their own faithlessness, they can no longer conceive of God and his love for them. All they can conceive of is God's desire to punish them. They have no concept of God's forgiveness or of his redemptive love. They can only imagine his retribution. And so they hide. But what if? What if when Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden, they instead rushed out to meet him? What if on being asked about their new desire to be clothed, instead of blaming others, they instead each owned their own failure? I sometimes wonder whether the whole trajectory of the fall could have have taken us down a different path. Nonetheless, what has happened has happened and we still live with the consequences. So God asked some questions of Adam concerning his newfound desire to play hide and seek and also of his awareness of his nakedness. And Adam, being the honourable and brave man that he is, of course I'm being tongue-in-cheek here, unashamedly blames his wife. Eve, also not wishing to take ownership for her actions, blames that pesky snake. Not one of them trusts in God's character enough to say, Yes, God, I did exactly what you told me not to do. And just as sadly, not one of them sought to hide the shame or cover the sin of the other. If Adam had indeed been some sort of godly man, not only might he have said, you know what, God, I really just screwed up badly. I did the wrong thing and I've sinned against you. He might have also, instead of blaming his wife, sought to have covered her stupidity by acknowledging that he had not said a word or intervened when he easily could have and said, sorry, God, I was not the sort of man that I should have been in this situation. Instead, not only does he blame me, but he also blames God because he said, God, the woman that you gave me, she was the one who gave me the fruit. Very sad story. And of course, when we look at it still to this very day, there's this human propensity in all of us. When we get caught in a situation that's difficult or painful, the first thing we want to do is to make excuses and to try, if we're able to, to blame others for what has taken place. Very rarely do any of us, when we're caught out, want to stick up our hand and say, I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing. And the reality is, when we're really honest, when we get down to it, time and time again, 
That's what exactly has taken place. You and I have made decisions to do something that goes against the nature and character of our God and that goes against the character and the nature of other people. We want to protect ourselves at all costs. We don't trust God and his forgiveness enough. So in Genesis chapter 3, it continues in verse 14 to 19. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise sorry, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So already, even back in Genesis, we have God's plan for salvation being worked out. Already we have a prophecy pointing to the cross when Jesus will tread on the head of the snake, but at the same time, the snake will of course bruise his heel. He will be crucified in the process. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. So God's not confused about this. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The image of God has been cracked and distorted in both men and women. God curses both the man and the woman, and of course, the snake. Instead of both finding peace and joy in their relationship with God and each other, now they're going to seek to find their identity in one another and in their work. And I'll explain this. The woman in particular will no longer be her husband's friend and equal. Instead, on one hand, she's going to try and gain her sense of value from him, from her relationship to him. And on the other hand, he will take advantage of her neediness and weakness and rule over her. Their mutuality and equality has been taken away. And whilst we can say this is not 100% true in every case, the reality is it would seem that amongst women there is this need to find their identity in their relationships, both with their spouses their children and others. This, of course, can be a blessing, but it also becomes the basis for a curse because when we try to find our identity in anything other than God, then those things have the power to destroy us, to ruin us and consume us. And when we look at the man, on the other hand, he will desperately try and prove himself by his work. And yet he'll quickly discover that no matter how hard he works, no matter what position he gains, or how much money he makes, he will still never feel satisfied or truly at peace with himself. In fact, most of the time his work will only lead to frustration and disappointment. And we see this time and time again as men throw themselves into work becoming workaholics, trying to prove themselves, trying to gain the approval of others. And of course, at the end of the day, they end up burdened, burnt out, stressed out, and really with very little peace. The man and the woman have now decided to trust in their own wisdom and knowledge rather than living in a perfect trust relationship with the father. Up until the fall, the man and the woman were protected, they were fed, they were sheltered, and they were assured of being loved and of value. Their value came from having a right relationship with the Father who loves them perfectly. Now they've decided to trust themselves. They're going to find themselves trying desperately to seek the very things that they had before apart from God. They're going to trust their own efforts, their own ways. And this is ultimately death. Of course, God has said they will die and they will indeed return to the ground now. They're not going to live forever. They cannot live forever. But it's death in a far more deeper way than simply physical death. It's a death of the soul. 
It's a death of the being, the fullness of being of who we were meant to be. The creation has now fallen and man and woman now no longer know what it means to live in relationship with the Father or with one another. What a tragedy.